Porsche was a workaholic. His engineering genius combined with an independent turn of mind that at times threatened to force a promising career in the German motor industry off the rails. Porsche quarreled with Austro Daimler and resigned in 1923. He left Austria to join the Daimler company in Stuttgart, Germany. Porsche's design ideas were by no means as outlandish as many around at the time, but he still managed to make many enemies in the conservative German motor industry. He left Daimler after a disagreement in 1928, and when a new venture in Austria collapsed because of the Wall Street crash, Porsche decided he had no alternative but to establish an independent design team in Germany. The shape that was to become the VW Beetle first began to appear in a series of Porsche designs of the early 30s. This is the Porsche Type 12 of 1932. Another element that would become a major component of the VW Beetle, the Porsche torsion bar suspension, was also a product of the early 30s. In 1933, Porsche designed this car, the Type 32, for the German motorbike manufacturer, NSU. Only three were built before the project was abandoned, but the Type 32, with its air-cooled rear engine and distinctive body shape, would be Porsche's starting point for the design of a German Volkswagen, or people's car. When Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933, he ordered the building of a new system of freeways, known as autobahns. He also wanted to build a small car that could be produced in large numbers and sold cheaply to members of the German working class. Hitler summoned Porsche to a meeting in the autumn of 1933 and set out his design parameters for an air-cooled family car that could be produced for less than a thousand German Reichsmarks. Hitler knew exactly what he wanted. At later meetings, he even made his own sketches, suggesting modifications to Porsche's Type 32 layout. He said, it should look like a beetle. You only have to look at nature to find out what streamlining is. Das ist die Fähigkeit eines glänzenden Konstrukteurs und der Mitarbeiter des Stabes gelungen ist. Die Vorentwürfe... Porsche called the project Type 60 and signed a contract for its development in June 1934. In February 1935, Hitler optimistically announced that testing would be complete by the middle of the year. Two prototypes were built in the garage of Ferdinand Porsche's house. One was an open-top cabriolet, the other a closed sedan. Porsche's biggest problem was developing a cheap, simple, air-cooled engine. He tried several different formats, including a two-cylinder version, before settling on the four-cylinder layout that would go on to power more than 20 million Volkswagens. It was called the E-Motor, with a capacity of just under one liter. Hitler's specifications were strict. The car was to be very fuel efficient, capable of traveling 100 kilometers on just seven liters of fuel from its front-mounted tank. That's better than 40 miles to the gallon. In 1936, three more experimental prototypes were built. They were prepared by Porsche to undertake a punishing test program, which would be carried out by the German Automobile Manufacturers Association. The cars were to cover a punishing 18,000 miles in the Black Forest, through the Alps, and on the new autobahns. Tests on the prototypes did reveal weaknesses, but reports were generally favorable. 
The Manufacturers Association doubted that the car could be produced for Hitler's price. Hitler took the project and gave it to the German Labour Front. The Front commissioned Daimler-Benz to produce 30 cars, to be tested by the Nazi SS. Hitler was strongly influenced by Henry Ford. He knew that Ford had built his factories close to canal, river, and sea transport. He decided on a location in northern Germany, close to major canals and the Rhine River. In May 1938, a flamboyant Nazi ceremony was held near the village of Fallersleben to lay the foundation stone for a factory that Hitler intended to rival the giants of Detroit. At the same ceremony, he announced, much to the dismay of Ferdinand Porsche, that the car was to be called the KDF Wagen. The letters KDF in German stand for strength through joy. Worse still, the town that would house the new factory's workers would be called KDF Stadt, town of the strength through joy cars. The job of driving Hitler from the ceremony was given to Ferry Porsche, Ferdinand's son. This car was presented to Hitler for his 50th birthday. Hitler never learned to drive. Work began immediately on the KDF factory. the spring of 1939, the first stage was completed. The plan was to produce 150,000 cars in 1940, with the output rising by 1943 to one and a half million. This would make the KDF plant the largest European motor manufacturer by far. Its output would realize Hitler's dream of rivaling the great American automotive giants. An unusual system was invented to sell the output of this factory to the German public. Buyers were issued with a savings book. Payments were made by buying stamps, and the cost of placing the order and insuring the car were added to the basic price. The only car color was blue-gray. By the end of 1938, almost 170,000 cars had been ordered. Distribution of the cars was also unusual. Not until the final stamp had been bought could the customer collect his car. And they literally had to collect it from the factory. There would be no agents or middlemen in this process. If the buyer couldn't collect it, there would be a delivery charge of around 5% of the purchase price. Two derivatives of the KDF entered development. Their purpose was much more related to Hitler's military plans than the people's car. The Kubelwagen was a rough terrain vehicle able to carry three men and a machine gun. It had reduced gearing so that it could be driven at the pace of a soldier walking with a full pack. Its high ground clearance allowed it to cope with a variety of off-road conditions. The second variant was more unusual. It was the Schwimmwagen. The KDF body was replaced with a waterproof tub-like shell. The standard transmission was replaced with a four-wheel drive arrangement, allowing the vehicle to combine the virtues of an amphibian and an off-road vehicle. By the time Hitler invaded Poland in September 1939, the number of Germans ordering the people's car was swelling. The KDF Wagen had now reached its production form. The Spartan interior had to be big enough to seat two adults and three children to conform with Hitler's decree that the children and the parents should not be separated. It could cover the autobahns at 100 kilometers an hour. But the coming war would prevent the hundreds of thousands of German families who had placed their order from ever receiving their cars. This is the ultimate form of the KDF Wagen, a 1943 model now in the Volkswagen Museum. 
That was the year in which Hitler had planned production to reach one and a half million cars. The first KDF Wagen came off the production line in August 1940, but by the time this car was produced in 1943, the total output of KDF Wagens was a mere 640. Most of them became personal transport for important members of the Nazi party. The priorities of war diverted the resources of the factory to the war effort, including parts for aircraft and the V-1 missile. The factory therefore became a target for Allied bombers, which in a series of raids in 1944 managed to destroy three quarters of the plant. In the wreckage of Germany's post-war streets, Hitler's grandiose scheme for the people's car seemed to be of another age. The idea of a Volkswagen in every German garage was a remote fantasy from the mind of a dead dictator. But something strange was about to happen. The Allied forces occupying Germany needed reliable personal transport. Their own cars were in short supply and breakdowns were common. Part of the KDF factory still stood. A young British major, Ivan Hurst, was asked to look at the possibilities. My initial brief was that that should be uh, zero, just to go to Wolfsburg and take charge of a factory, a derelict factory. Hurst had to assess the condition of the wreckage and decide what was to be done. Well, most of the machine tools were still around. They'd been moved into cellars against possible bombing, which of course in the event did happen. Uh, the big presses were there, and the press tools were there. Hurst found a workforce in ex-German prisoners of war from the British prison camps. Production of the Beetle really got going on a small scale, of course, but this was a time when no other manufacturer in Germany was producing cars at all. First got going in, um, in March 1946 at a rate of 1,000 cars a month, which was the, the limit set by the availability of materials. The British Army placed an order for 20,000 cars. By the end of 1946, more than 7,500 Volkswagens had emerged from the factory. Hitler's people's car was on the Autobahn, fulfilling his specifications of speed and fuel consumption, but under very different circumstances from those he'd planned. In 1947 was a time of complete uh, change of the political climate. The Iron Curtain had come down, the Berlin airlift was on. While Volkswagen and the rest of Europe coped with the Soviet blockade of Berlin, Major Hurst and his superior officer, Colonel Radcliffe, began to look for a German to take over the running of the expanding Volkswagen factory. Initially, they found this to be a very difficult task. We looked around, asked around to the German Motor Industry Federation and to personal contacts and found nobody who was prepared to take on the job. Eventually, Heinz Nordhoff was appointed Volkswagen's general manager. In 1949, the ownership of Volkswagen was transferred to Germany. Nordhoff was taking on an immense challenge. The German economy was devastated, and Volkswagen had the potential to be one of the major tools for its reconstruction. Nordhoff's background was in engineering and in truck manufacture for the Opel company. He decided on a one-model policy. The Volkswagen factory would produce only the Beetle, and there'd be no radical changes in appearance. 
production